everyone. Uh, welcome to our talk here in red. So today we'll be discussing some of the advances in red team tactics that have come to light over the past 12 or 18 months. Um, we've tried to cover a broad range of areas, um, starting from the outside with green bomb, moving on to infiltration, through to establishing C2 and natural movement. We'll talk about some of the things that we found most interesting, including some of the tools and techniques developed by other researchers, as well as some of the tools that we've developed in house and that proved useful to us in our engagement. Um, we'll be also be releasing uh, the code for the majority of the tools that we demonstrate today. Um, so who are we? Well, my name is Dominic Chow. I work for a company called MBSA. Um, I've been a pen tester for roughly 13 years. Um, at MBSEC, I've got overall responsibility for MBSEC's CVEST and STAR services. I'm Vincent Yu. I operate on the active breach team at MBSEC. I'm generally interested in anything red team related or with a bit of blue splash in, the blue team as well. Um, so, from our perspective, over the last few years, we've really noticed much more focus being paid to red team exercises. Particularly the last 12 months or so as a company, we've had a lot more clients come to us asking us about red teaming over traditional penetration testing. I'm not sure exactly why this is, but I strongly suspect it's partly due to buy-in from the regulators and the creation of structured framework frameworks. So we've now got things like the CBED scheme that's backed by the Bank of England, the FCA and the NCSC. We've got the uh, teams, TIMA scheme over in Holland, which is backed by the Central Bank of the Netherlands, and we've got the ICAS scheme over in Hong Kong. Um, so like yin and yang, because red teaming becomes more prominent, so does blue teaming. Advances in um, defensive controls, um, sandboxing technologies, uh, things like Microsoft ATA, LAPS, device guard, credential guard, as well as the rise of threat hunters, that's people who are actively, proactively and intuitively searching through networks looking for threats, all making red teaming considerably harder. So the red team must evolve. <coughs> and really that's the inspiration for this talk because we kind of feel there's been a lot of real advances and interesting developments over the past 12 months. So I'm going to hand you over to Vin who will talk through some of the tools that we've developed in-house to aid with the reconnaissance. <coughs> so in terms of reconnaissance, we found that you know, we're, we're here trying to determine a client's sort of a still infrastructure or you know, some sort of asset that we might, might want to target from the outside. One thing that kept cropping up for us that we would require in every engagement was a sort of reliable list of email addresses for their employees so that we could use them in you know, spear phishing campaigns or even um, password spraying on external, uh, on external infrastructure, for example. So uh, traditionally, email collections performed using um, open source uh, websites like search engines such as Google, Bing, or uh, social media like LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, and maybe even like Showdown. So in this talk, we're gonna just focus on LinkedIn. Uh, so on LinkedIn, you can actually see the person's name, the title, the sort of location. So these are uh, good pieces of information to have when you were to get from LinkedIn. Um, on LinkedIn as well, actually you can search by a company's name. So here I'm just searching for a company called General Motors. And when you click on the General Motors company page, you have, you're actually sent to another page with less sort of a link that lets you filter and browse by that particular company's employee. So the tools that we found that was perform this either used an API key or were broken due to the numerous uh, UI updates over the past year on LinkedIn. So we went ahead and developed a tool that we call LinkedIn, which streamlines the collection process. So what you would, the ideal situation is that we just give it a company name that we want to target and potentially like the domain name to sort of like scope down to that specific, uh, specific company, if there's like company sharing company names. Um, so it's based off of a scraper that a guy called Danny Crasthill wrote. We've um, basically fixed the UI issues and added uh, email prediction sort of uh, capability using a 
a service known as Earth Hunter that my computer used to find email addresses. So I'm just going to give you a quick demo of the LinkedIn service. Right, so we begin by opening the tool and putting in the company name that we want to target, give it a file name, we want to fill by the company, and put the company's domain in. Uh, I soon realised that I've got the wrong domain, one Google and found the correct domain, it's gm.com. Uh, type auto here, so it uses Hunter to form its um, prediction. And then basically start scraping through LinkedIn for. Um, uh, details of an employee. <coughs> so the headless profiles down here are basically due to the account that I'm using and that account doesn't have a third degree connection to that specific user so I can't view their details. So to improve that sort of like the number of employees that you can scrape, you could go and target and start connecting with employees of the organisation. So the output is sort of in two formats, a HTML page and then a CSV. The HTML is a sort of report with like images, first name, last name, predicted email address, the title and the location. So the location is particularly useful in scenarios where you only want to target the UK um, employees and not the global organisation. Uh, CSV is perfect for pen testers that want to copy the whole, uh, the whole list of emails to. So you can just copy the column, copy and paste it into a text file and be a user. <coughs> So now I'm going to give it back to Dan for so infiltration. Um, so uh, infiltration is often one of the hardest parts of red team engagement. Um, traditionally, there's been a lot of focus on things like phishing, um, but this is something that's a well-known tactic that's something that's closely monitored by the blue team. So unless you're creating particularly low-noise, highly targeted spear phishing campaigns, there's a chance that you may get spotted. So we were particularly interested in other vectors uh, targeting corporate networks aside from phishing. Although I do have to admit in some cases it is simply as easy as sending a very carefully crafted email as we found out with Colin who we just sent an email asking him to run this Python command on the terminal of his MacBook, which he went on to do. However, in this case we did find ourselves, we didn't anticipate it, but we did find ourselves giving text support to Colin due to the version of Python OpenSSL that was on his Mac. So, one of the tactics that we've had a lot of success with is targeting AD connected services, um, particularly things like Exchange. And there's been some really impressive tooling released over the past 18 or so months. So, firstly, in September last year, a guy called DAFCAT released a tool called MailSniper. So, MailSniper is quite a, um, an aggressive tool. It basically allows you to do things like credential spraying and password loophole attacks against the Exchange environments. So, you can take the output of Bin's LinkedIn tool and pump it into something like MailSniper and it'll help you identify uh, weak credentials, AD credentials. Um, you can also do things like uh, retrieve the global catalogue as well as filter through inboxes for sensitive information. Um, so that was quite an impressive tool to help you find AD credentials. Now, around about the same time, um, Luke Roberts from MWR and Etienne Stalmans from Centipost and basically improved on an idea that was originally created by Nick Landers. Um, so essentially the concept was that if you compromise somebody's exchange inbox, you can inject using the MAPI, uh, the exchange MAPI API, you can inject an outlet rule that will ultimately allow you to execute command on the user's workstation. Now, um, the tooling that the approach that Centerpost and MWR took was kind of interesting, and given they both released it at the same time, um, it was interesting to see that they both approached it from two different perspectives. So MWR approached it from the perspective of um, post-exploitation, in that if you compromise somebody's um, workstation already, you can inject an outlet rule that will allow you to ultimately execute command for long-term persistence. Whereas um, Etienne approached it from the perspective of infiltration, so he bundled it with um, the password spraying and the credential brute force attacks. Um, 
and he was able to actually inject the wall from the outside. Now, um, unfortunately, this, there were some limitations to this technique. Predominantly, you were only actually able to execute the command without any arguments, which meant that you actually had to um, host the file that you wanted to execute on something like a web dev share, which may not necessarily always be available through the portable proxy. Uh, so more recently, in April this year, Etienne improved on the technique in that he basically discovered that Outlook had some functionality to allow you to customize the look and feel of an email. And the way the look and feel of an email was customized was um, through VB script. Now, um, what Etienne discovered was, and this technique was really interesting because it was synchronized across all devices, but what he discovered was that even if you have macros disabled on Outlook, you can still execute the VB script through an Outlook form. So essentially, this provided a, a new way to execute arbitrary VB scripts on a user's workstation if you compromise their inbox without having to have a file hosted. Um, in May this year, Microsoft actually went on. It's worth noting that Microsoft actually went on with a couple of updates, and they have now effectively blocked the malicious um, OWA rules. However, the Outlook Forms technique should still work. So with this previous work, on Exchange in mind, we started to think about what other exposed services were integrated into Active Directory. Now, one that kept cropping up for us was we, from time to time, would find exposed um, Microsoft Link or Skype for business services online. But there wasn't any real research on how to kind of target or attack these services. So, Skype for Business typically comes in one or two flavors. That is using an on-premise Skype for Business server that's integrated into your internal ID, or it's using federated authentication. And federated authentication basically will allow you to integrate into things like Office 365. Um, it's quite trivial to find whether or not an organisation is using Skype for Business because um, Skype for Business uses the concept of auto discover. So you'll typically find a DNS entry things like link discover or link discover internal dot whatever the company's domain name is. If they don't exist, you may also find that the banners for Skype for Business are quite distinctive. So scanning the organization's printer may help you find these services, or looking on things like show them. So I was particularly interested in how widespread um, Skype for Business deployments were. So we did a quick scan of the Alexa Top 1 million. Uh, what we found was that roughly 26% of the uh, Alexa Top 1 million were using Skype for Business. And of that, 3.7% were using Office 365. So the attack surface is actually quite large. Um, and with this in mind, we really decided to focus on developing some tools to attack these services. And this led to the development of one of our tools called Link Sniper. So when we were developing this tool, um, the first thing we had to really do was understand how the authentication worked for Skype for Business. And what we found was Skype for Business actually supported a number of ways of authenticating. Predominantly, it was NTLM, Kerberos, and OAuth. Um, the one that we focused on really was OAuth, mainly because we found on MSDN that it could be disabled, um, but also it was actually the easiest to work with. So when we dug into it, what we found was actually uh, the way the OAuth was done was first you needed to make an auto discover request, find out where the Skype business endpoints were, and then it's just simply a post request supplying the grant type parameter of password, and then you can do username and password authentication. So this was actually pretty simple to implement. Unfortunately, what we found was um, when we started to look at Office 365, was um, this parameter wasn't supported on Office 365. Office 365 actually used the core Windows Live authentication. That is using WS Trust and RST, these are the core um, protocols used by Microsoft's ADFS and security token services. Um, but fortunately for us, this was actually quite well documented on MSDN. We actually even found some examples of how to authenticate to Skype, and we, them, uh, we implemented them in PowerShell and brought them into our, our Link Sniper tool. And at the current, in the current state, Link Sniper will actually do things like password brute forcing, password spraying attacks. But some of the additional functionality that we're working on is retrieving things like the global address book and um, performing IAM based spear phishing. Because if you're actually able to compromise somebody's Skype business account, you can then use it to target some of their contacts internally and impersonate that user within the company. So I'll show you a very quick demo of the tool and how it works.
So as I mentioned before, um, Link Sniper is essentially just a bunch of um, PowerShell commandlets. And we can feed it, in this case, we're going to feed it a list of users. And we're going to tell it to invoke Link Spray. And the first thing it will do is perform auto discovery to find out where the service endpoints are. In this case, the Office 365. And it will try uh, whatever we tell it to do, uh, whatever password we try to uh, attempt, it will try them against all these supplied email addresses. And in this case, you can see it's actually found a user called joe.bots.nbc.co.uk. And obviously, this account doesn't exist anymore, and just for the purposes of this demo, with a password ever both them on. We don't actually even use Skype for business, so but feel free to try it. <laughs> Um, so while describing Skype authentication, I did briefly mention um, the concept of ADFS a couple of times, but I didn't actually go on to say what it is. Um, so ADFS is basically a way of providing a single sign-on across trust boundaries. But unofficially, you can really think of it as a way of um, exposing Active Directory to the internet, which is pretty awesome from an offensive perspective. Um, essentially what it allows you to do is um, securely share a uh, user's identity um, across trust boundaries. Now that might be from domain to domain, i.e. from company A to company B, or it might be from company A to Microsoft themselves. Now, in, in, the, in, the, in the latter case, uh, this would typically be something you would see when it's integrated into Office 365. Um, so what we did was, uh, we actually registered a new Office 365 account, and when we were diving, we enabled federated authentication. And when we were looking at the Skype Business configuration, we found this interesting option within our Skype Business console, which basically says allow external communications. And as you can see, uh, the definition of this is let people use Skype Business to communicate with Skype users outside of your organization. Now, this was really interesting to me. So what that actually means is that I found a company and I've got external communications turned on and um, I've got federated authentication. Any other Skype user can talk to the users within my organization. Um, so this is really useful for doing things like direct spear phishing of users. Even so we don't actually have to go and compromise any AD credentials of that user. We can contact the users as an external company. We can do things like user enumeration because Skype Business will tell us whether or not those users actually exist. We can get information on uh, user awareness so we can see whether somebody is online at a given time, which might be useful if we're doing like a physical red team and we want to see if somebody's at the desk, or maybe we're doing one of the exchange attacks where it requires the user to have Outlook open at a given time when we're doing the synchronization. So what we actually did was, um, when we created a new Office 365 account, we actually created one under the name of Skype Support, as you can see up here. Um, and I enabled federated authentication on uh, NDSEC's Office 365 uh, Skype for Business Setup. And what I was able to do from an external user, uh, I was able to message this Joe Boggs user saying, uh, hey, you know, we've got an update to Skype, please download and uh, run this Etsy. Now, um, as you can see on the right hand side, the Joe Bob user, uh, all he sees is it's coming from Skype support. The only real kind of potential clue is that it's not from within his company, is that it actually says external network up here. So that indicates that it's not part of MDSEC's organization. But you could also dive into the contact and get information about it and find out what the email address is. But in this case, what we actually did was we went and um, looked online for expiring domains and we found a Microsoft domain that had just expired and we sniped it. So basically we've now got a domain that has got Microsoft.com in its name and it's an old Microsoft domain with categorization and history applied to it and it would look very similar to something that a Microsoft support user might actually have. And this has proved successful to us on a number of engagements for social engineering users. So, moving on from infiltration, but in a similar kind of area, we'll talk about some of the things that we've developed for defensive evasion. This is really the tricks that have come to life for evading specific security products or blue team monitoring tactics. So, categorization. Um, so, the corporate web proxy is really one of the first lines of defense for a company because it, it provides all the ingress and egress points for a user's web traffic. 
Now, one of the security controls that is often implemented within companies is this concept of categorization. So essentially, all domains and sites need to be categorized to go through the proxy. Anything that is uncategorized will be blacklisted. Now, this can be problematic for us if we're looking to conduct a phishing exercise or we're trying to establish C2 because our domain ultimately needs to be categorized. So the traditional approach for getting around this is using tools like CatMyFish and Domain Hunter, which will actually search online, help you find domains that are about to expire or have just expired and have already been categorized in a safe category and you can go on and purchase them. The biggest problem with this is it doesn't actually allow you to get any target specific or type of swatted domains. So say for example we were targeting somebody like uh, Bank of America, we wouldn't be able to register a domain like bankofamericaservices.com and then use it for phishing because it wouldn't be categorised and it might not actually get through the corporate proxy. Um, so we started to look at this and we started to look at how the categorization was being performed and how we could get sites categorised. We went on to develop a tool called Chameleon which we'll be releasing after the conference. So um, Chameleon basically identified a number of flaws with how different um, proxies determine whether or not a site is categorised and what category it should be in. In some cases we actually found that we could instantly categorise any site that we just registered, any domain that we just registered. In worst case it takes to, to about six hours. Currently the tool supports um, categorisation for blue coat, categorization for McAfee, and categorization for IBM's X-Force. So, one of the things we found was that in some cases, the proxies don't even actually ever check whether the domain exists. They will just arbitrarily do no validation of whatever domain you give it. So in this case, you can see, I just submitted a host, or devil.ireas don't even exist, what the fuck I can't. Uh, and I told, it, I told IBM that this was a banking site. And an hour later, I checked the category again and it was banking. McAfee, um, similar kind of thing. I just submitted a domain that didn't even exist. And McAfee, six hours later, categorized it as finance and banking. So I'll give you a quick demo of the, uh, the community tool. So, basically what I'm doing here is I've just uh, created a new host, so the host hasn't existed, I've literally just created it, this host is called c2.apt1.info, and you can see it now resolves, I'm now using the chameleon tool, and I'm telling it to categorise this host against all the proxies that chameleon supports. Now, the first one is it's going to try uh, and categorise it against blue code. Now what it does is, uh, we found a flaw of the way that Bluecoat determined whether or not a site should be categorised based up. So what we were able to do was clone another site, modify the HTML within that page. We basically found that if you set the base href within the HTML page to point to the site that you wanted to match the category of, Bluecoat would just accept it. So you can see here, it did flip up a second ago, but Bluecoat was saying it was financial services. But if we go to Bluecoat's website and we just check the category again now, we can see that c 2apt info is categorised as financial services and that happened instantly. So you can see there's obviously some flaws in how uh, categorization is actually done. So I'm going to pass you over to Vin, we'll talk a little bit about our Alright, so I guess um if you were here for um, Chris Trunk's talk a bit earlier and um, Randy's talk, yeah, we've already gone through um, sandboxes, but I'll just do it briefly here. So sandboxes were to solve the limitations of antivirus, where it was based off of signature detection in Android. Um, so the idea of being able to have these malware analysis sandboxes is to provide the in-house capability of performing it in an automated fashion. Um, so what it will do is it will take that file that it suspects is potentially malware or it doesn't know yet and then it will run it in a um, controlled environment that's supposed to be isolated from the internet and shouldn't connect it at all. We found some uh, 
Uh, we found some scenarios where it does connect out and it does leave information about the sandbox, which um, isn't great, and bad practice. Um, we also found that, um, so basically what it does is it examines what happens when you execute that piece of that file, that piece of malware, and if it calls out to a registry and starts adding new run keys, like Chris Trump said earlier, or um, connects out to a C2 um, channel, then it will um, detect it as malicious. So it looks for these malicious indicators. So we did a quick case study. We've seen a FireEye malware protection system quite a lot. Um, Web MPS, the email MPS and such. Um, we found that in a lot of the organizations that we've seen use it, had a had deployment issues, like mainly design issues or the way that they were using these appliances. So for example, if a employee clicks on a link, they might not um, you know, they might have to serve the file before it's even scanned and you have it, you, yeah, before an outcome is even um, achieved um, or you've got the result of what the uh, sandbox thinks is the um, whether it's malicious or not. So that's sort of like the flaw would then enable like let the payload through before the um, sandbox has finished its job. Um, we also found that there were a number of limitations in the FireEye um, MPS, um, like one being file type. So, sure, you have sandbox the proper file types like executables, libraries, uh, office documents, archives, and shortcuts. But we found that it didn't um, sandbox at all, at least in all of our test cases, HTML applications or JavaScript files. So you could just send them a HTA file or a JavaScript file containing malicious code and it will just ignore it because it doesn't know what to do with it. Uh, we also found that there were predefined guest images. Uh, I looked on FireEye's website, it says that they get updates every month or so. Um, so the, I guess the idea is that if you've got a predefined guest image, someone who gets their hands on one of these appliances can extract the guest images and start reverse engineering it to look for environment variables or whatnot. Um, like, Basically, information about that particular sandbox to key against it and tie up payloads to not run in that environment. So, now that I've talked about HTML applications, um, I've already established that it doesn't scan these HTA files. We've created a tool called um, GenHTA, which creates HTML applications that have some sort of anti sandbox technique. So, we've created this with the idea of like, if any sandbox in the future begins to um, look at HTA files, then hopefully we're ahead of the game and it won't affect us at all. We probably won't even notice there being a sandbox at all. So currently there's only a few formats, um, the main being the dummy input form, like sort of like a questionnaire that someone has to fill in. Um, it waits for user submission and then, so if they submit that form, it will begin to trigger the malicious payload. So what this also provides is it adds realism to a campaign. So if you're sending a, an employee with a missed delivery sort of like email like from courier, then the moment they click on the link, if nothing happens and all that happens is a flash on the screen, then they'll start getting suspicious. So frameworks like Metaploit Framework, um, Cobalt Strike and Empire will generate a, um, a HD file that basically just poses like after it's triggered the payload. So that's not really realistic. Whereas if you have like a form that they could fill in to like maybe reschedule that delivery, it will allow to um, make it a bit more realistic. So I'm just going to give a quick demo of the GenPHD. So this video was actually recorded before I added a few more techniques. Um, so it currently only has two in the video. But it's got some sort of anti-analysis technique. So what I'm doing here is I'm selecting the, the main type of uh, anti-analysis technique that I was talking about. They'll begin filling in the form as, um, as instructed. Here we're doing a dentist appointment booking. Uh, enter a URL. They'll download this image, uh, embed it within the HTA file so it doesn't require outbound communications anymore. Uh, you start filling in some information about the campaign, some questions. Here I select so I want to put in five questions. Sort of um, inputs that you can have right now are radio selectors, input boxes, and text areas. So I'm just here filling that up. <coughs> right, 
right, so it's generated. So I'm just going to show you what it looks like after it's generated. So it gives you this sort of form. It's not actually cut off in real life, but I have to put off the screen a little bit to make it fit in the white screen. But yeah, that's the sort of form that you'd be presented with, and you'd have to either submit the, uh, submit the form or exit to trigger the payload. <laughs> so I guess what, what this does is it makes it so that the payload will only execute when someone actually fills in this form or interacts with it. And then if the sandbox can't or doesn't know how to interact with this specific file, then it'll never trigger the payload. So another thing that we've noticed quite a lot with the blue team recently was like they now have the capability to monitor process spawning relationships from parent to child nodes um, process, uh, uh, processes or even command line logging. So the idea of like the sort of approach is to provide the security operations center with oversight of these um, processes being spawned on specific endpoints. And then you can start creating rules and analysis um, around that collected data. So some of the examples are such, like, um, such as mshda.exe spawning powershell.exe, that might be a big red flag that they could alert on because um, frameworks such as Empire and Cold Strike generate these types of payloads. Uh, I know for a fact Metasploit Frameworks hda-psh payload will do this as well, so immediately red flags right there. Command line logging. So if they start looking for words like dash encoded command, dash encoded, uh, any substring up to around dash enc, then that's another flag for them to um, alert on. And potentially long PowerShell command as well, if they try to contain the entire script within the command line. So now I've talked about like, a few bypasses that we've sort of found within um, client environments. So, so what if um, the blue team looking for the action code command? You can use a less known um, alias um, dash ec, which is often overlooks because it's not a substring of dash encoded command. So that's another one to add to your um, rule list if you're on a blue team. Um, in terms of the dash in dash encoded command, you can use a Unicode character, um, the Unicode dash. So if you open up character map, go to 2015, there's a dash that you can just copy and paste and replace all your dashes with to sort of like hopefully if the blue team are looking for the ASCII dash it will no longer detect it. Um, so I've not noted 2015 here but there's actually a few dashes that will also be passed the same way by Windows and be treated as a flag. So now what if they're looking for dash, uh, uh, no what if they're looking for invoke expression or invoke web request. So here's a quick um, is a short sort of proof of concept I made of Valor. Um, I've got some of these carrots, what we call them, to sort of separate the PowerShell command. And then uh, instead of using IEX, I'm using this dot here, which evaluates the sort of command that comes after it. Uh, instead of using both web requests, I'm here using nslookup to do a DNS text query for calc.vincentu.pro.uk, which basically just says calc.exe. And then what this will do is then execute calc. You could, however, split up a stager into 255 byte chunks and then loop through um, DNS text records and concatenate a payload and execute it as well. If you want. And then that would make it fully um, DNS stage and delivered. Um, so, Dave, uh, Daniel Bahanan has actually created a tool called Involve Cradle Crafter um, and he released it a bit earlier in, on in the year which basically allows you to specify a, a URL to a PowerShell script that you would like to run on the internet. And what it looks, will do is it will craft a PowerShell download field that's reasonably uh, obfuscated, then you can paste it into the rest of your um, implants to, um, to then call out and hopefully it will log the same in the command. So what if mshda.exe was spawn in PowerShell.exe? So Matt Nelson has recently indicated to me that you can actually use the SWBEM locator uh, com object to create a process. What this will do is it will use WMI to spawn the process and then the MSHTA.exe parent will no longer um, be shown because it will 
execute PowerShell under the concepts of WMI, PR, BSE, the Um Another way to sort of like bypass that restriction is I uh, created a sort of like weaponized proof of concept like James Forshaw had, um, which was called .NET to JScript. What this allows you to do is bootstrap C# -sharp binaries within JavaScript, VBA, and VBS file. So um, there's a similar thing to what Cactus Touch does called Starfighters by Sinelis. His tool allows you to run PowerShell without the PowerShell binary, essentially, if it's blocks in application wirelessly. But I didn't really want to use PowerShell as necessary, so I created Cactus Touch. Uh, Cactus Touch generates um, VBA, VBS, JS, and HTA files currently, so payloads. So what you do is you specify a binary, like this spoken in sys 64 and system32. So code strike likes to use run dll32.exe. Um, I like to use ping.exe. Uh, so yeah. And you specify 54 or 32 for shell code in base64. So with these two parameters, we pass it into a bootstrap uh, C sharp binary that I've written, like embed to within each one of those file formats which will then spawn that process and inject into it. Um, so I haven't got a demo in this case, but it will be released after the talk. So now I'm going to move on to command and control. So domain fronting has been used historically for bypassing censorship issues in tools such as Tools. Um, but in this scenario, we're going to use it to mask malicious infrastructure. So, we at NISA decided to research into the CloudFront content delivery network, or Amazon's. And we found that if you connect to any edge node, you can supply it a host header of you know, my malicious instance, and it will connect to my particular instance to grab um, data, as opposed to the, the actual ones that you connect to. So, for example, if you connect it to a0.adrs.com, so you do that DNS query, you get a CloudFront edge node back, and then you connect to it and you specify the host header, my instance of CloudFront it will actually grab the resource from my particular instance as opposed to the actual website. So, what was interesting was I then looked into the fact that you could use C names to basically, if you're like bankofamerica.com, um, you probably want to have CDN at Bank of America .com as opposed to um, as opposed to some randomly generated cloud.net which doesn't look that great. So what we did was um, I scanned uh, did a lot of DNS lookups for C names on the uh, Alexa top one million domains. Um, had to do quite a bit of like subdomain uh, subdomain guessing. And then I ran it and checked all the C names and grepped for CloudFront.net essentially. Found like 15,000 um, employees, uh, uh, my employees, um, domains were actually using CloudFront as a CDN. So here's some examples. Uh, I found that api.hsbc.com was using it, so uh, yeah. There's also some government ones in the US that were. I think there's like a prison one somewhere. And there's also cdn.az.gov, which is one of my favorites to use. So, so right, domain fronting is great. We can hide our malicious infrastructure behind these domains, but there's also some shortcomings. So, we found that it only works <coughs> in environments with either no proxy in use or the proxy was not RFC 2616 compliant. Um, section 1423. Um, so we found that one anomaly, which was the Sophos Web Gateway. So when I tried on the Sophos Web Gateway, it would just work. And it would actually think like I'm communicating with a government domain from the logs. Um, I've got highlighted rumors about Cisco and Palo Alto, but I guess that's for uh, further investigation. So what this can allow you to do is, after you've already infiltrated the organization and established C2, you can use this additional way to set up uh, an extra covert communication channel for long-term persistence using like a government domain. But whilst after you've already infiltrated, you can perform this internal recon and then sort of determine what software and what products are in use and make sure that your C2 can be established using the domain for now. 
Uh, alternatively, there's no group CA. Um, you can TLS the connection and it'll work. But I've found scenarios where if the proxy cannot decrypt slash traffic and analyze it, it won't, um, it'll just drop the packet. So, um, here's a quick demo on the domain printing version. So on the left here, we'll begin by listing our DNS cache on the machine, so you can see it's empty. And then I execute the domain fronting payload. And on the right, we immediately see a DNS query for cdn.az.go. On the left, we can see it's now on the DNS cache on the machine. So what's interesting is I actually use a few more domains, uh, but they have a USA spending of code and one in the UK. Um, so an attacker could actually create a payload that used like maybe a thousand domains or even all fifteen thousand that you found, and then that will hopefully set the blue team up on a you know an interesting investigation to try and block them off. And that will just do through lots two ways to So now if we sort of list it by like the IP address that it resolves to, we can see that like, there's a number of different edge nodes that it's found. So that also gives you different IP addresses that it connects to, so if they can't just by one IP. So here we're just on the quick look into the sort of packet itself. We can see that like, you know it grabs a resource activity from cdn.az.gov, but the host header is actually to my host system. Now I'm just going to look into lateral movement a little bit. <laughs> so recently, um, <laughs> okay. So in terms of lateral movement, there are well-known techniques: PXXF, WMI um, for execution, um, partial remoting, but so we've, um, we've actually looked at RDP for quite a while and I'm sure a lot of people already know about this, but there's not been like a like proof of concept out there that you can just rapidly deploy and use on an engagement. So when you mount your drives whilst RDPing using remote desktop onto a machine, you actually expose a backslash backslash TSI backslash C on that particular machine. So say in, within that session, you can actually query and grab files from your host machine. So it then, so some testers might use it for easy exfiltration or even to put payloads into the environment that they want to use. Um, so what the RDP inception sort of proof of concept that I made does is it puts a file in the start folder within the RDP session. And what happens is, when that sysadmin or user logs into that machine with a mounted drive, it will then run that, that binary that's put in the stack location because it's under his account. And then what it will do is it'll self propagate into his host and then backdoor his host as well. So next time when the host restarts, it'll actually, it'll actually execute that payload and you'll get a shell on that host as opposed to within that session. So what this sort of does is it self-propagates in worms upwards and in back. Um, so it's sort of useful in these sort of situations. Let's say we're down here attacking the environment. We've got, uh, we've got access to a database server within the DMZ. That server can't talk out to anywhere else in the corporate network. The only firewall rules are inbound 3389 over RDP. So there's not much we can do from here. We probably can't attack anywhere else. But if we use this sort of technique, Next time someone logs in from this file server, for whatever reason, into the database server over RDP, with drives mounted, it will then attack the server. And then what this will do is, we'll get a shell here. And then this will just keep spiraling upwards until it hits this, um, this sysadmin logging into the corporate network from uh, VPN into a management job box or something. That's just a theoretical scenario. Um, so, in order to sort of understand how many people actually do map the drives and how viable this attack vector is, um, I sampled 127 people on Twitter um, associated with cybersecurity. 
around 50% said that they do mount drives within our DP session, so it sort of gives us an understanding of how cool the technique is. Um, so now I'm going to pass you back on to John. Okay, so um, historically there's been a really limited number of techniques to move from one host to another. Um, typically we've been restricted to things like his exec, 3MI, WinRM scheduled tasks. Um, while these techniques are great, um, they've also got certain indicators associated with them. Uh, and they're quite often slow to monitored by the blue team. However, in January this year, Matt Nelson introduced a new technique using the component object model. Essentially, what Matt um, demonstrated was that the MMC application uh, had got a com object associated with it that had a that was accessible over DCOM. And this com object had effectively got a method called execute shell command. So what that meant was that if we got sufficient privileges to um, connect to a host, we could actually invoke this um, com object using DCOM and remotely execute commands on a given host. Now, this seems to be something that somewhat flew under the radar. Um, a lot of people haven't picked up on it, it wasn't too well publicised, but we've been using this quite well on um, engagements to laterally move within an environment, and today it's not actually been picked up by any Blue Team monitoring. Then, one thing that we couldn't really not mention uh, when talking about kind of advances in Red Team Tactics in the past 12 months was the Talk for Blood Now. There's probably something you're familiar with, it's got a lot of publicity and it's quite a um, it's quite a awesome tool for us. So what Bloodhound does is, um, once you're in an AD environment, you can uh, run the collector agent, so it will go off and uh, collect a bunch of information about the active directory environment, things like logon sessions, uh, group memberships, local admins. Uh, and what it will allow you to do is, uh, basically it will produce a graph using uh, graph theory to uh, visualize the AD environment. So why is this useful? Well, effectively, it will map the relationship between all the different nodes and provide potential paths for privilege escalation based on those relationships. So let's say, for example, we fish the user called Alice, and it would be immediately obvious that Alice was a member of the help desk group, but there might be a nested group showing that the help desk group is a member of the support group, and that might not be too obvious to us straight away, but Bloodhound will quite quickly work that out. And in this case, maybe the support group has got admin rights to a server like the SharePoint server, and maybe the SharePoint server has got an admin log on at that given time. So what this would allow us to do is quite quickly, with the Alice user, log straight onto the SharePoint server, hijack the domain admin's log session. So if we look at an example of what the output from Bloodhound would be, um, so say we compromised Alice up here, we can see Alice is a member of the uh, support group, which is a member of the help desk group, which has got admin rights on the SharePoint server, uh, which has got the domain admin logged on, and that's the quickest path for escalation to get to the domain admin. The quickest this has got us from uh, fish to uh, getting like the AI environment was about an hour and eight minutes, which was pretty good. Um, but it didn't stop there. In May this year, there was another major update to the Bloodhound tool, and the guys basically introduced the concept of ACLs as an attack path. Now, um, Basically what this does is Bloodhound will now map out all the ACLs or all AD objects and it will attempt to identify potentially misconfigured access control entities. So uh, particularly things that can be used for privilege escalation. So these include things like the false password change attribute, which if this is misconfigured could allow you to change another user's password without knowledge of their current password. Or things like the generic write attribute, which might allow you to just completely update uh, an object. So what you could do in this case would be update something like the script path parameter and um, point it to an executable, which would get executed the next time the user logs on. Um, aside from that, there's been some further additional, quite interesting AD research that's been performed in the last 12 months. Um, something that really stood out to us was some of the um, Kerberos delegation research performed by Ben Campbell, uh, Will Schroeder and Benjamin Delphi. Essentially at the heart of this research was the concept of Kerberos delegation. That is the ability to give a service a token that allows it to impersonate another user. Uh, and in order to do this, um, a, server, uh, a service account must effectively have this uh, trusted to authenticate the delegation by the it. However, to avoid the concept of unconstrained delegation, that is where you've got a ticket granting ticket that allows the service to impersonate any other service or machine on the domain, uh, Microsoft introduced uh, this additional attribute, this MSDS allowed to delegate to, 
which will then basically restrict the um, services to given SPNs. So what does this mean from an offensive perspective? Well, essentially, if we compromise a service account through something like a co-hosting attack, um, we could potentially use it to impersonate any AB user to the given SPN that is set in the MS uh, DS allowed to delegate to. Um, so for example, or what was initially thought was, if we compromised uh, a service that was allowed to impersonate a, a uh, MS SQL uh, SPN, we could effectively get DBA rights on that SQL server. But further research was performed by Alberto Salino from the Core Impact team, and he basically demonstrated that um, actually the SPN, um, the service name in the SPN didn't actually matter, and you could uh, modify the, S the service name uh, and directly compromise the actual host. Then there were some major updates to the Power View tools, uh, Keko and IAM uh, IM Packet to actually go on and exploit some of these issues. Um, so what's next? Well, while the past 12 to 18 months have been pretty exciting from a red team perspective, there was a lot of material, and I know we've covered a lot today, we did actually drop out our 30 slides because we had so much stuff we wanted to talk about. Um, but personally, I think we'll start to see more focus on things like defensive evasion, um, as the guys who gave the talk before has showed, there's some really interesting sandbox evasion techniques coming up. Um, we might see focus on things like device bar bypasses, credential bar, uh, as Windows 10 becomes more widely adopted. Hopefully we'll see further AD research, and hopefully we'll cover some additional hidden gems like the S4U itself. But more generally speaking, I expect the area of red teaming to grow quite a lot. Um, I strongly suspect we'll probably see more sector-specific frameworks, things like the CBEST scheme, outside of finance, we're focusing on other sectors. And finally, um, just thanks to all the researchers that we talked about in our uh, presentation. Um, if you're not following some of these guys on Twitter, I would highly recommend it, because they're picking out a lot of awesome stuff. Thank you, and any questions? Uh, yes, yeah, quick question. Uh, how many have you uh, released all of those tools? Because I've got Google to They all, um, basically, if you go to a GitHub account called uh, MDSec Active Breach, uh, there are blank repos on there which we can push everything to, um, like this again. So, yeah, they should all be Cool. Any more questions? It's all right, I can talk loud, it's fine. Um, this distributed com object, is that, does that tend to be more locked down than WMI or PSXX or less, or and what protocol does it need to the network? Sorry? The distributed com object with the invoke shell command, yeah. how is that locked down? Well, that was, it was actually MMC applications, um, <laughs> that was the com object. And uh, com objects are accessible over DEFON. Oh, some com objects are accessible over DEFON. Um, James Walshaw has also released quite an interesting tool called uh, OEL uh, OLE View, yeah. um, which you can basically uh, run on a Windows system and it will map out all the um, com objects that are on the system and it's got like a filter to search for which ones are actually accessible through DEFON. Um, 